Cool. John O'Shea, welcome to the Wolf Den. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, mate, I thought we might start talking about combat sports. So your, I don't know if you put it up or your social media department, but you put the fear into the racing community, you and Tommy Berry with your kickboxing exploits up in Thailand. What's, well, uh, uh, no, I, I'm not a kickboxer. I enjoy boxing, but um, I, I go sort of once or twice a year just to, to train and, and to reset because obviously we live a pretty unhealthy lifestyle here and I enjoy it. I sort of box once a week or twice a week if I can. And um, I took Tommy and Huey with me this time and, and they really enjoyed it. You yeah. know? So I think Tommy walked on about 62 and walked off about 58. So yeah. it's a hard week. And uh, like I said, but I really enjoy the, you know, the physicality of it and, um, and, and sort of like you come away from it fresh and ready to attack the spring. Yeah. How's Tommy going? He's, he's on his extended holiday at the moment, but he's... Yeah, well, he gets, uh, it's fantastic for him because he, he's five weeks away and he probably, he'd been riding work and it was a good break for him just to rejuvenate and then sort of, you know, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel because he comes back to trials this week and full time. And then obviously he starts on the 24th of September. So, you know, he, there's, there's a real need for him, to be honest, yeah. at the moment. And uh, he's going to come out of the gates running. What's the need? What, explain well, that I then. just think that, you know, with Huey and Brenton going, yeah. um, they're just probably a bit shy of that real top-class rider and Max pulling their pants down on a regular basis. And, you know, Nash is sort of – he's struggling to stay <laughs> – stay on the track because he's getting a few suspensions. So if you come away from those top boys, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's, there's a big gap from the, the top boys to the second tier. And, uh, and, yeah, that's why, you know, James is so very good. But when Hugh and Brenton, Tommy, and if you've got a one or two others there keeping him honest, it, it just adds a bit of opportunity for other stables to sort of be competitive. Yeah, and how's Huey going because he's – had a big season in Hong Kong, and I think he's had a wonderful season. He's really keen, on, you know. I know to, to you know, to be as competitive uh, at the top at, yeah. in Hong Kong as he possibly can, and uh, and hence, you know, he wanted to get there very fit and start the season, come out of the gates running. So, um, you know, I think his weight would probably mean that he struggled to be, you know, quite as effective as um, Zach. But yeah. I know he wants to be very competitive at that level. Yeah. We had Zach in for a podcast last week and he's pretty fired up. He, yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's good to, to challenge him because he's such a competitive guy, Zach. Yeah. You know, like them, he'll see the, you know, the competition and the threat that, you, you know, obviously he's a great rider and, and you know, it'll, it'll propel him to be as good as he possibly can. What about you in Hong Kong? Has Hong Kong ever been on the, on the radar for you? No. Um, I, I, you know, I, I probably... I've got four kids, mate, and they. And I think when you go to Hong Kong, you either got to go when they're very young, mm. or they've left home, and mm. and ours are spread out over a long time. And I, you know, I remember when Darren went and left young Mitch. I think he was only sort of seventeen or eighteen, and and that was sort of a challenging time for their family. And um, and I've sort of I thought that you know we've got you know I've still got teenagers, so yeah. it just does. It's just never suited, you know. And I don't know whether, you know, I. I prefer to train horses over a little bit of ground and probably Hong Kong's, you know, not for me. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, you know, it suits some, but it probably not, you know, it's never Have been. Have they ever so. approached you about no. it? No. I, yeah. I had a discussion with them, like, very early in my career and I didn't go because I, I wasn't ready. Yeah. And, and my children were young then, but, I, it, you know, and then things change. And, yeah. yeah. So with your career, you started up in Cairns and uh, I liked one quote where you said that a big part of – those early training days was getting horses ready, having a bet and getting some money in to, to keep going to the next week. Is that is that how it was? Well, you have to start, you know, we start with absolutely nothing. Well, we started in the negatives actually because we had to borrow money to start, yeah. you know. So, um, yeah, like I, I probably started sort of semi you know, assistant to Gary Moore and uh, when I come to Sydney after working for Gay and Bart and, and um, I wanted to go training but, it, you know, obviously I had no money so... We got a thing called Getty Ready on Anzac Day, one day at Ramwick, um, and you know it won, and you know it cost me the job, and and but I was able to go training, you know, sort of two or three months after that, you know. So, and yeah, I suppose that sort of when you have nothing, you sort of you do whatever you can to to get started and and get a quid, and and so betting, and you know, I, I sort of come through a betting background. My father was a bookmaker, and 
Um, it was always something that we knew I knew about, and I had great mates in the you know in the betting ring in Sydney, and Stewie Davis yeah. and Peter Longworth, and yeah. you know I sort of grew up you know watching Kingsley and and the boys start their careers. You know we used to go to the Rusty Shovel on Saturday nights after a round week meeting, and the betting would continue there. You know, so yeah. in one form or another. So, but yeah, things that, that's how I started anyway. Yeah, and so the Getty story. So. When you say you're getting it ready, what what does that exactly mean? Like? Well, he'd had a run when Gary, you know, Gary was training and he'd only just started and, and he was just learning his craft more than anything. So he'd had a run and run last somewhere, I can't remember what it was, in a midweek at Randwick and, and Gary jumped on a kite and went to Hong Kong for, you know, extended period. And, mm-hmm. and so while he was away, Jimmy Cassidy and I sort of went about making sure that the next time the horse went to the races, he was ready to perform. and. Mm-hmm. And so they bet eighty to one, and um, I think yes, beat about sixteen dollars on the day. So um, yeah, was, I mean you couldn't get much on on a Sunday. On a you know yeah. it was an off day, Anzac Day at Randwick, but you know you could go along and four thousand to fifty along the on the ring, yeah. and, and it was enough to like I said get started in a couple of weeks, later, um, a couple of months later. And why did it cost you the the job? Well, Gaz. <coughs> well, there was because he, he got left out. Well, you know, we actually told him, you know, that you know, Gaz, we think this can run well today. Oh no, yeah. he said, "Good night, wait, blah blah blah." And so, <laughs> um, anyway, when it won, he sort of Mr. Murray had an inquiry, obviously, you know, and he said, oh, well, "You're no good asking me. You have to ask my foreman." So I had to go to an inquiry, and all it was a bit embarrassing, but um, you know, that's how. And then, you know, he knew I wanted to go train, and so he said, "Oh, it's probably time you move on," you know. Yeah, fair enough. And did Stewie and the boys were they in on it too? Did well, they? Custard, you know, Peter Long, he, he, you know, they sort of obviously used to feel there, and they all had a little bit of it. You know, I think Nobby f- probably still have the money you made. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he used to be. You know, he, he was one of the great men of the ring. So, um, yeah, he, all, we always used to do a little bit together. Yeah, yeah. and you still, see, you still see him a bit. Yeah, we had dinner last week, and they're in great. And I speak to Stewie sort of whenever, you know, every day we have runners and whatever else. So. No, they're in great form. I was at Bambini Trust the other week and he was having dinner there with all the other influential people in Sydney. This is Nobby. So. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you know, as we know, Jaime's sort of done a great – he's he's gone to, from strength to strength. Yeah. But uh, at their 40th, Johnny Kennedy stood up and said, you know, various things about <laughs> Peter and, and said to Jaime, you're the only bloke to lose on real estate in the eastern suburbs and call him a mock. So <laughs> it must have been the inspiration for him to stick, kick ahead. Yeah, no, they're, they're a good bunch of fellas. I know them well. Yeah. Um, and so around that time, <clears throat> oh, well, just quickly, so Gay and Bart, I mean, Gay, you were there for a couple of years. She must have been a huge influence. Tremendous. Um, you know, and... You know, I always had enormous respect for her and, you know, like even you know, just for the – because of the tuition, you know. And yeah. and so later on in life, you know, like if I'd train a group one winner, she'd always send me a nice text or whatever and I'd say, always, you know, thanks for the tuition. And, and you know, I sort of owed pretty much everything I learned uh, to get to that level from, to her. And then, you know, to go and work for Bart was just about um, fine-tuning that knowledge and, and, uh, and learning a different strategy to get the same result, you know. So yeah. – I was very lucky in the tuition I had and, you know, I'll always be eternally grateful to, to both of them, you know, because they took you under their wing and they wanted you to think like them. So, mm. um, yeah, you know, it's, you know very, I was very – I was blessed with what I learned. Yeah, because I had Gay in here the other week and sh- I asked her about her staff and she spoke so passionately about it and sort of said that a lot of them had become – champion trainers and different you know you're very much that mold as well mm. so yeah, she's a huge huge part of our industry isn't she and still still, still firing now. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's a great concept you know where adrian's been you know in, you know he's given her a new lease on life in that respect you know and like he probably appreciates the tuition and various stages and and he's doing a great job in his own right there so yeah. and barton gay so accomplished pretty much won every race in australia is there a race that you look at and be like, I've got to get that race before I'm done? Yeah, no, I mean, the biggest problem when you sort of only have a small team, it's hard to get, you know, repetitive runners in those races, you know, and yeah. um, I suppose, you know, the, you know, the Cox Plate's always um, a race that, you know, you'd always like to be very competitive in. It's, it's a very hard to win. It's a very hard to get a horse good enough to even make the field, you know, mm. so, um, yeah, I mean, they, they're sort of the great, you know, the top four always sort of, Mm. You know, as important as ever to, to try and be competitive in. So let's talk about the Cox Plate. You went close, racing to win. Let's go right back to start of racing to win. So you bought it as a yearling, yeah? Yep. Yeah. And can tell can tell us about like let's have a bit of a deep dive into racing to win because it was a fantastic horse. Obviously it had a huge impact on your career. Yep. 
and it's it's just a great story. It's a great story. We bought him, you know, for forty grand, and we thought we'd made a mistake when we bought him. Where we missed a, something, there must have been an X-ray issue. But it was just because they'd put him in the ring unreserved, and you know, those one thing they'd done. We owned him. Was he in Costa del Lago? In Costa del Lago. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and Costa was hot at the time, right? It was, well, yeah. Well, so we went there and had a bunch of and Costas on our on our list, and I can remember um, we had a filly in a colt, and the filly made four hundred, and I didn't think the colt was that much worse, and so I thought I'd oh, make two to three hundred, and he made mm. forty. So, mm. and it turned out to be racing to win. Um, he was a great horse to me at that stage. Mm. You know, he won sort of five group ones, and about four or five million dollars, and um, you know, like he's a dream horse. You know, you probably wish that you had him. Uh, a little bit later on in life when you knew a lot more about, you know, what you were doing. Um, you know, probably made a few blues later on in his career. Um, but, and you know, when I reflect back at his Cox Plate, you know, he, he I went, I followed the Sunline path in, into the Cox Plate. And so he was a miler and she was a miler. And, um, but I think when I reflect back on why he didn't perform in the Cox Plate, he, he had to beat up on Desert War within se twice within seven days. And at the time it didn't look like it was draining, but when you reflect back on what a champion Desert War was mm. and how hard he was to beat, it probably took more out of him than, you know, I thought. So um, there's little things you learn as you, you know, go through things, uh, get a bit more experience. And, and, and probably nowadays too that, you know, they don't penalise them. Uh, they, they try to encourage those good horses to run in Ramwick Miles now, whereas, you know, after he won the Epsom and the Doncaster, they give him 61, you know. Mm. Like, so whereas now he'd probably get into that same race of 58 and a half and give mm. him a chance to be competitive in them again. So it's uh, – but he is a great horse and, you know, we'll always be ever grateful for everything he did for us. Mm. And did you have a crack back in the day of the yearling sales? Like did you get yourself in, in uncomfortable I've never been, position? No, I've never been one to, to do that. Um, I've always sort of been very frugal with other people, other people's money, and yeah. and even now, I, you know, it's there's too much statistical data to say that the best horses in our country lob between 100 and 300. Yeah. You know, so I don't see the rationale behind yeah. you know doing that data and then going against what it tells you. Yeah. You know, so we sort of fish around that 50 to 250 mark, maybe 300 at a pinch. You know, so. yeah. And is it a huge part of your business getting to the right yearlings have you got to be in there and and, and be oh, it's it, do, it can make or break the next five years of what you do mm. you know so and obviously you get the right horse at the right price and it can make your season or make your career and boost your career at various times you know so um you know a horse for us like lost and running we paid 40 grand for him he's won five million and and my wife is lucky enough to own you know a small percentage of him as well so you know, they're sort of horses that, you know, really help you and give you a kick along. And how's he going? Well, we think he's going very well. Yeah. You know, Mac trolled him last week and gave him the thumbs up. So, you know, he's a horse that, you know, last season he had nothing go right in terms of wet tracks and wide barriers. So we're hoping that we can get a bit of positive continuity to the preparation. He can get himself back in the game. Is he in the, in the Everest yet? Not yet. But you'd always be... Oh, look, if he got an option, but there's so many other options. I mean, there's a race on the same day for two million... And, you know, the points still accrue for the sprinting series. So, yeah, I wouldn't, you know, if he made the field and we thought he could be competitive, we'd run him. But, you know, there's, like I say, there's a nice race on the same day for good money where he'd be a good quote in the market. You know. Yeah. So let's talk um, the Godolphin days or the Daly days. Big big point in your career. Um, it's obviously sort of considered the best, best job in the racing world, you know, training for them. My first question is, what was it like going into that world? Because there's a lot of affluence and wealth in racing, but when, you, when you're when you talking about Sheikh Mohammed and that, it's, it's on a completely different level. So what was it like sort of gently going into that world? And, and, and when you were interviewing for it, like did it get the stage where you were like flown to Dubai and met with the Sheikh and all that Yeah, kind of I did stuff? that. Yeah. yeah, so I did a day trip. Um, they, I was actually on a plane going to um, New Zealand for a ready-to-run sale, you know, and they rang and said, oh, would you be interested in taking the job? And so... They obviously <laughs> didn't bid a lot on too much on uh, the ready to run horse. We came back and had a meeting with them, and then they flew me to Dubai for a day and uh, went around the car with Sheikh Mohammed. It was you know surreal. So yeah, yeah, and came back and you know to be fair, my wife wasn't overly keen about doing it, and um, she took a bit of convincing um, for various reasons. And you know, as it turns out, she's always right. So um, <laughs> and then started. Um, Oh, in about May of the following next year and yeah I found it the transition extremely difficult yeah. you know and 
So eventually we got a good team around us and Darren Beaven was extremely helpful in that and we're able to sort of get things rolling and, and, and but it was never you know, it once you've run your own business and you go to work for someone else, it's probably a, a really you know, and at that stage of my life was sort of early forties or late mid forties and you know, you sort of get a bit set in your ways and you have an agenda where all you want to do is get the right result, you yeah. know. So yes. But when you go to work for a big organisation, that's not necessarily what their agenda is. You know, mm. their agenda is there's so many people that have to be placated underneath the boss and mm. if you had to just deal with him, well, life would be really easy. And that's where Charlie's probably lucky in that, you know, he gets to – he rings the boss on it. He directs – This is Charlie Appleby, yeah, right? Who's so, the, he trains for them in Europe. Yeah, yeah. so he – and he speaks to the boss on a daily. Well, I spoke to the boss once in my life. You know, the first day I took the job, really? I never spoke to him ever. Yeah, right. So, yeah. And so, you found that difficult, did you? Well, I found the difficulty in the in the in the tiers of management. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, the like I say that their agenda wasn't necessarily what you know. Like for example, say when I mean Hartnell, he wins a Turnbull, he beats Jamaica by six, and he would have been a six to four favourite in the Caulfield Cup. And then someone comes in from Europe and says, oh, no, it's, it's got to run in the Cox Plate against Winks because the, we've got another horse coming in from Europe. And you look at him and say, you doing what? You know, like, so <laughs> yeah. those sort of things are, you know. There's unilateral decisions that get yeah. frustrating. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think that ultimately I will be ever eternally grateful for the opportunity yeah. because it made me a better trainer, a better, you know, better at everything. So, um, but ultimately I missed the I, I didn't enjoy the isolation as well. I miss my mates. I miss you know like yeah. being no, around Nobby and no, Stewie. Yeah. And Stewie. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> and you know and so ultimately, as I, you know, I said my wife, she's smart for a reason. And you know, I, I think that I mean, like I said, I really enjoyed the three years, but I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. And during that time, you, you had a Stern. Is that the best horse you trained, a Stern? Oh, Hartnell was the best horse we had. Yeah. There. yeah. I, a Stern is a great horse, and but he was always had an issue. You know, he was always temperature here, and and that was his limiting factor. You know, like to for him going on to be a really top horse. You know, yeah. so um, I think he got a. You know, he, he won the Golden Rose. He had a temp after the Golden Rose. He won and come back in the autumn. Same thing. You know, like he was always sort of a very fragile horse. You know, so probably never quite got to the level where he was capable of getting. Yeah. And then so you you decided to walk away after three years and then you got a, an immense challenge to get yourself back to the level that you were at. And so what what, what was the process involved there? Like what was your first – what were the first couple of things you did when you decided you want to come back in your own right? Um, well, we had, obviously we had – James took the job which worked out conveniently because we were able to get 50 boxes at Ramwick. But yeah. the problem with that is that – I probably needed a break, yeah. you know, and I didn't do that because 50 box at Ramwick only become available on very limited occasions. So it meant we had to go straight back to work. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that is the hardest thing I've ever done is start back, you know, yeah. for, you know, five horses going to Hawkesbury on a Sunday, in a, you know, like in class one. And it's just yeah. such a massive challenge, yeah. you know. So, um, and it was mentally draining, you know, so, but, once you get back to where, you know, you're having a full stable, decent horse going, decent races, yeah. it's, it's fine. And you had to get all the staff back and it's hard to get... Hard yeah, well, a lot of my staff old staff it? came, you know, came back. back. But, you know, again, I, I didn't have enough horses to facilitate them initially. So, you know, they had to come back in dribs and drabs. and Yeah, but eventually they sort of worked themselves out. Yeah. And you sort of had a reputation back in the young years as being really intense and really, really focused on... On your craft, are you? Do you think you take it? You got a more mellow approach these days, and do you have to be like that? Yeah, I think that that comes from you know coming from nothing. Mm. You know, yeah. like so, you know, you, yeah. I, I think you know, like blokes like Peter Moody and myself, and even Chris to a less extent, we come from you know places that people can't even pronounce or have never been to. You yeah. know, like so. So I come from a place in North Queensland, that, you know, just inside of Cairns and, you know, small town and, you know, to end up even training at Ramwick is a, you know, if you'd have said to someone, to, you know, when I was 18, you know, I'm a trainer at Ramwick, they'd say, I'll laugh at you, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, and so you to get to where we want to get to, it's probably we've got to work a bit harder and be, a, you know, a bit more ruthless in what we do. Yeah. So, um, and there's no doubting, you know, that, but as you get, bit older and a bit more mellow you realize that you know with time 
it's going to happen whether it, no matter what you do, you know. So yeah, I think that's probably the contributing factor that, you know, and probably the two most influential people in my life would be my father and, and Gay. Yeah. There's not too many more intense individuals. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, and that's, you know, so they're, they're, that's more reflect on the influences in your life. You know? Yeah. And you mentioned Chris there. I heard an interesting quote that you said to Richard Callender, actually I was chatting to Richard Callender about you, and he said that you said to him once, if you had winks, you wouldn't have had the success Chris had because you wouldn't have had the patience with her to do what Chris had did. Is that right? Well, I think that what Chris did with her, I don't think, you know, I mean, even Peter to a lesser extent with his man, you know, to have those horses to, um, yeah, I, I just, to produce them year in, year out where they don't have a foot abscess, a temperature or whatever, you know, like that, it's... It's just remarkable what they did, yeah. you know, like both of them and, and particularly with Winx, you know, like yeah. I think that, you know, what Chris did there was, well, you know, irrespective of her ability, you know, like he was able to continually produce at her best for four seasons. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, four years and eight seasons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's just remarkable. Yeah. And would you have run her in a Melbourne Cup? No. No? Yeah. No. no I probably – and I, I don't think I'd have run her – I wouldn't have run her in an Australian Oaks and I definitely – she would have gone to the paddock and yet her greatest achievement was that's when she sort of – come when she went to Queensland is when yeah. she really blossomed, yeah. you know. So all those things you think back, oh, how would I have done that? Well, you know, I wouldn't have done those two things for starters and probably they were probably the makings of what she did. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and you're a proud Queenslander and I, at the lunch – we're at a charity lunch the other day run by the Calendar family, which was a great day. We all had a good time. But Richard Callender got you up there and t- talked about you being mates with Billy Slater. And my question is, why do you, you know, you obviously know Billy personally, and why do you think he's been so successful as the Queensland coach? Well, he gets Queensland. And I laugh that um, um, when people say about Queenslanders, and in particular the state of origin, is that, you know, the Queenslanders hate New South Wales. I don't necessarily think that's the case. Mm-hmm. I think they just love Queensland. Mm-hmm. And Billy gets what it is. So when you come from North Queensland, you, there's an even greater, yeah. you know, empathy for our state. Yeah. You know? So and Billy gets what it is. I mean, and you talk about, well, I come from humble beginnings. Well, Billy probably is the same, you know. Yeah. Like, he comes from very humble beginnings in his file. The boys tell me that, and, and, you know, that even as a 15, 16-year-old, he, he wasn't even in the Innisfail under-16 side. You yeah. know? So he had to... For him to get to where he got to, he got there through hard work and and uh, and then ultimately he had natural ability as well. But it, there was a frightful amount of hard work. You know? So, um, yeah, I think when you come from those humble beginnings, you have to work so extremely hard to get you, you, you know, and he gets what it is to be a Queenslander and, and he instills that in in his sides and he's, he's, he's done a remarkable job, yeah. you know, remarkable job. And he, he loves his horse racing? Loves it. I mean, yeah. that's where... He um he came down and wrote a bit of work for Gay and I was working for Bart at the time and this little kid trotted past me. He said, Oh dad said because I knew his father when we were playing football in North Queensland. So you've known him that long, wow. Yeah, he and, knew when he was writing for Gay. And he said, Oh dad said to say hello and yeah, you know, there's this little <laughs> kid from Innisfail sitting up on a horse trotting past the gay. I said, Oh, g'day, mate. You know, I, said, oh, I can I couldn't remember he was a little kid, but I knew, like I said I knew his father and yeah. who was a good bit older than me, but you know, he's a you know, great North Queensland footballer and you'd you'd see him at the rugby league there on a regular basis so yeah he was um and that you know and then he went on to you know play for melbourne and whatever else you know who's your nrl team i'm a cowboy supporter okay yeah and um what do you think about do you think people are saying reese walsh is the heir apparent to billy's crown as the well he's <laughs> he's definitely that i mean he's probably even ahead of billy at the same stage sure. you know he's only 20 yeah. 21 or whatever he is yeah and, He's probably achieved more than Billy. And Billy was only playing for Queensland on the wing and he's doing a good job for Melbourne. Reese Walsh has become an absolute superstar and the fact they're only paying him 600000 a year is probably, yeah. you know, they're in for a frightful challenge when they try to, you know, renegotiate oh, his deal. Who's going to win the comp? Well, they can win it. Yeah. Brisbane, yeah. So Is that, is that your tip? Or? I would definitely, yeah, I so think they'll win it. If yeah. you had to bet, you'd back Brisbane? Mm. Okay, not Penrith? Well, Penrith... Uh, Penrith, there's no doubting of this, but I, I think Brisbane will beat them. How do horse trainers go at tipping rugby league teams? Not that well. I, I mean, <laughs> the, probably the we the, I, the the best bet I had for a while was the, the year Happy Clapper won the Epsom and and Melbourne won the Grand Final. I think we got twelve to one the double, and 
and that's probably the last time I've had any sort of decent bet on a football team. You know. Very good. And uh, you mentioned you're a very proud Queenslander. Do you head back there one day? And re- no, 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 no. Sydney's home forever. Sydney. Well, my kids all sort yeah. of grew up here, and they, they they've got no ambition to ever move back there. And there's just nothing for them, you know. So, and particularly if you want to be involved in the racing industry, which I I will till I drop. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's no, no. You're like, hey, you'll keep going till you drop. Yeah. You never. No. No plan to ever retire. Well, I love it. Yeah. So, and 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 I watch Bart. You know, at 84, sort of come to the track in the morning and, and you know, it stimulated him and gave him mm. something to get out of bed for and he was still – he loved imparting that knowledge and, and I would think that – not that I want to be doing it at 84, but I would think that I would want to be active and, and I, I don't want to sit and be idle and, mm. and vegetate and wait to die, basically. Yeah. Any kids involved in your business? My son uh, – got a second uh, – my second son Jordan who he's worked as at university and, and he works for us at the moment but you know as to whether he probably prefers the punting side of things yeah. he's, he likes to cards with Stewie and, yeah. and you know gambling and but he's you know he's there and enjoys it yeah. excellent well it's a, a good place to finish mate beautiful thank you very much mate great chat and um much success over spring have let's you hope so. good on you mate thank you cheers